Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, on the plane over here, I decided to use this venue instead um, at the suggestion of Stuart, actually. I gave a, a keynote speech at a wireless sensor systems conference in Chicago. And what I want to do instead is raise a bunch of questions that, that have been rattling around in my head about where are we going to take sensor networks now that we've become starting to become successful deploying these things in the field. How are we, how do, what impact does this have on the internet architecture? How, do, how are we going to tie these into the rest of the internet and develop applications on top in the future? So I'm going to apologize in advance. My, this talk is going to raise more questions than, than answers. So, um, you know, and I want to get feedback. The, the idea here is to have a discussion. So here's the problem in a nutshell. And I think that most of us in this room, and we've seen this picture a few times today, if your mental model of a sensor network is Roughly, uh, we start with a cloud of moats that we deploy out, and there's some uh, lines between them that indicate something about radio links. Uh, we'd like to have some kind of a base station that we can use for controlling it or for collecting data. And then um, the, the question is, you know, what's the, what's the stuff that it ties into? And so what we do here is we paint it pink and we put a somebody else's problem field around it. And I've seen a number of these pictures today where effectively the sensor network is there, but then there's something connected off, off to the sensor network, but we don't know what that something is. And we kind of have a question mark and maybe a person sitting at a keyboard. But I have a, the question is, what's in that cloud? So um, I think that, you know, the given, given that we've got this, this you know, great success in sensor networks and a lot of work going, a lot of activity there, I think the next question to be asking is, how are we going to integrate them with the rest of the internet? And I call this a cri crisis of connectivity. It's a crisis in the sense that you know we're we're going to be able to do this now. Now the question is, how do we tie it in? And I don't I don't think that there's an obvious answer to this. I think that there's been some proposals, but really not enough work on this problem. A um, couple of things that we need to keep in mind. First of all, sensor nets are not just passive instruments. We can program them. We can retask them. And I think that that changes the nature of how we think about interacting with them. Uh, from an internet perspective. And they're not like internet services either in the sense that um, we can't provision them in the same way. If I um, become very popular as a website, I can buy more servers in a fatter network pipe. And a sensor network may have extremely limited capacity, yet very high demand for whatever data it's providing or for multiple applications that want to go in and program it and query it. So we have to think about, you know, how do we extend the internet architecture to support large numbers of wireless sensor networks in the wild? And um, lest you think, you know, so everybody's had their pic pretty pictures of their applications, so I'm going to do mine. And, but lest you think, you know, I'm just going to talk about what other people do. We're gonna t I'm going to tell you a little bit about lessons we learned trying to put a sensor network in the wild and trying to connect that thing up to the internet. So this was an application that we have. Uh, going on with um, geophysicists and seismologists at UNH, UNC, and in Ecuador to use sensor networks for monitoring volcanic eruptions. And the basic idea is that you've got a volcano and it's erupting and you're going to monitor things like the seismic activity at different positions along the volcano and the acoustic waves emanating from the volcano to understand the source mechanisms, what's going on inside the volcanic conduit that's causing these eruptions to occur and, and tremors and earthquakes and other things going on inside. So we developed this sensor network, and the basic architecture is fairly conventional from the point of view of in this room. I think that there's a number of things that are unique about this, but effectively we have a large multi-hop network. These are telos moats, and using appropriate antennas, we're able to get more than 400 meters range between them. So it's not very dense. It's extremely sparse. Uh, the um, base station is not at the same site as the sensor network because the sensor network is, you know, off in the jungle up on the sides of this volcano. The nearest place we could plug a laptop into the wall, and in fact there's no power there, we have to run an electric generator 24 hours a day, was four kilometers away. So we have to have some long distance connectivity. This is a four kilometer link. And of course we need tight time synchronization. That was discussed a little bit this morning in terms of how do you get these things to synchronize because when you collect all this data, 
If it's not well synchronized down to a single sample, down to less than a, a millisecond, the data is meaningless. So we, this is the basic architecture. And we deployed this this summer at a volcano in Ecuador called Reventador. This is a really active volcano. We have multiple eruptions and explosions per day. Uh, in one case, one of, the sensor, uh, one of the sensors was actually destroyed by a large boulder that was ejected from the vent of the volcano. So we have interesting failure modes. Um, this is one of my students, Conrad, who is working on this. And I'm showing the, there's these three uh, antennas here. They're all serving different functions in this case. One of them is a sensor node. One of them is our GPS receiver for the time base. This is our base station that's relaying the data over this directional antenna back to the observatory. The next sensor node, if you see this little white line right here, this is the next node that's over 100, 150 meters away. So they're not really densely, uh, the, the picture's a little misleading in that sense, but they're actually quite far from each other. So we deployed this. It ran for about three weeks. We got hundreds of explosions, eruptions, earthquakes, things like that. Um, many, many gigabytes of data logged. Uh, and we're still sifting through it and trying to make sense of it all. There's an example of one eruption, and this is all 16 sensor nodes reporting the signal here. And this is after significant filtering and time correction of the data so that it all lines up. So it's not like it comes in in this form on the screen. And the seismologists are really frustrated because we're collecting all this data. And we're saying, see, look at all the data on the screen. It's numbers. <laughs> and they want to see the, the wiggles, as they call them. And unfortunately, we couldn't show it to them for weeks because we had to go through and clean up the data. So some immediate questions, issues, problems that um, came up. The first thing is, you know, this wasn't really connected to anything. We're logging the data on our laptop at the observatory and not in a form that any scientist would ever want to use. And we've been trying to shield them from that. And this is a frustrating problem because they have their own data formats and they have tools, significant pieces of software that they're ready to consume our data, but we have to get it into the right form for them. And this is very frustrating. We tried to make the data available via the internet. And uh, in fact, NASA was already, the idea of we had a website set up. And every time there was an eruption, we'd calculate some statistics on it and upload that to a web page. And NASA had some folks, JPL had some folks that were, gonna, that were monitoring the web page. And after each eruption, we're going to retarget the EO1 satellite to take a satellite image of the volcano just following the eruption on the next orbital pass. So this would have been like the coolest thing ever. And of course, we, we ran into the last mile problem, or the last 484 miles problem, because that's the orbital elevation of the iridium satellites. As it turns out that we're trying to use an iridium satellite phone to get an uplink to the internet. And I just, I could never get it to, I, got, I think I got a login prompt once, and then it hung up. So even though they claim global coverage and you just plug this cable into your laptop, it didn't work. So it's a good, I don't know why, but it's, a, it's very frustrating. So when we're in these extremely remote places, we're going to have to think about how, how, do we, how do we solve that problem. And of course, it's not going to be connected 24-7 anyway. So you have a question about, well, if it's intermittently connected, what's the right model for tying the sensor network? What's that? It never worked. We could, I mean, that's, yeah, that's one way of thinking about it. But so the question is, what's the right communications model? So it's not like we're going we're gonna to give the sensor network an IP address and we're going to you know, open a TCP connection to it or something from the outside world. So here's an, here's an interesting problem. How do we tie these sensor networks in? Some of this is engineering, but some of it's just architecture. Yeah. There's no cell phone coverage. I mean, this is pretty remote, pretty remote place. So, the other one, and, and this is you know, just being completely um, you know, talking about all of our applications and showing pretty pictures. Um, medical care is another application. And I promised in my abstract that I'd mention our medical applications. So we're working on this project called Code Blue, which is a platform for medical sensors and doing a lot of different things in different, different clinical and, and hospital environments. So we've developed a number of moat-based medical sensors. We have a pulse oximeter. We have an EKG. I think Jack, Jack's group is using these. Uh, a couple of other groups are using these. We developed a very specialized sensor for tracking limb motion and muscular activity. So you know, the moats have been a really nice platform for doing various types of biosensing. Um, the next question then is, of course, once I can get this data, what do I do with it? Um, one of the applications that we're looking at is disaster response, the idea of putting a bunch of sensors on many, many patients to track their status in a large-scale emergency. So let's say we have these 
twin brothers here that happen to be medics, and they're carrying some PDA or something to receive data on. What they're going to do is place sensors on the disaster victims and then issue some type of a query. So, we, you know, TinyDB style data acquisition to this network of sensors that are on these patients. And the sensors are going to report back. And in this case, we need multicast because we have multiple receiving devices. And we can't use aggregation because it's not meaningful to ask what's the average heart rate of the patients. <laughs> That's probably not something you'd want. So there's some question, but we can still do some of the type of type of in more more intelligent data acquisition techniques. We'd like to know, for example, if a patient suddenly drops out, is is that because they wandered off, the battery died, the sensor fell off the person's finger, what happened here? And so there's a, you know, we need we need this the network to be reactive to these types of things. So one of the things we've developed, and this is part of our collaboration with Feng Zhao's group here, is, uh, is a web services interface to this. And we've just started to experiment with this. But let's say that we had a number of disaster sites or ambulances around a city somewhere with these um, code blue networks of vital sign sensors. And th this is a realistic scenario. We're working with the cities of Malden, Everett, and Medford. They're very worried about large scale disaster like a tanker bomb-laden tanker coming into the harbor and blowing up and sending chemicals everywhere. And so this is like, you know, the city governments are actually nervous about this stuff. So if you had a large-scale disaster, you had a number of medics and ambulances at the site, how do you tie that into things like the EMS 911 dispatch system so that you could do triage and know wh where to send different patients to different hospitals and trauma centers? Um, hospital information, the, the hospitals have pretty significant information systems. What do you do? to tie into those systems. The hospital staff also want to query the, the, the status of patients out in the field from where they're standing so that they know who's coming in and how to prepare to treat them. So, you know, the, you know, the answer is web services, right? <laughs> if you, I don't know what the question is, but it, the answer is web services. Um, but this is, you know, a nice way of thinking about the problem in terms of we could really use this um, a programmatic interface. So what's come out of this is I think is really more important than the particular format on the wire. It's not so, I mean, it is SOAP, but it doesn't matter that it's SOAP. It's a, the fact that now we've opened up this network of sensors to applications that know how to speak SOAP over the Internet. And so all of the functions here are exposed through this programmatic interface. It's not just, well, here, read my technical report to figure out what the packet format is. Okay, so there's some, we're starting to, to get our, our feet wet with that. Deborah scooped me a little bit on this, but I'm going to go through it anyway. Um, the question that makes all of this come to a head, I think, is when we start going after sensor networks that are much larger in scale than a bunch of moats like that you could fit on a table or in a box or in Prabal's case in a few semi-trucks or something, that... Um, putting thousands of sensors all over the planet. And there's a number of very large efforts in the, in the real sciences, <laughs> the physical sciences, to do this. And EarthScope is one. This is a big NSF project. They're going to be putting 15-year effort to understand basically everything going on with North America seismically and, and tectonically and everything else. So they're going to put 400 seismometers and 1,000 GPS stations and 180 strain meters all over North America. Um, Deborah had the same picture here. I had to augment it a little bit, so she's down there with her sensor node. But um, NEON is another big project that Deborah mentioned earlier, and that's trying to do. Oh, nice to that picture, <laughs> and you put your own copyright on it. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. That, sorry, I can fix that. All right, there. All right. It's fixed. It's fixed. It's fixed. There. Sorry. Um, well, that, your picture's there. That, that, was, that was the, the indirect credit. credit. There you go. <laughs> and, of course, you know, NASA's in on the game, too. So their idea, and this was one of our demonstrations with them, was the sensor web's concept of how do you integrate data from both ground and space-based sensing assets. And the idea that they have, for example, is if I have a, if I have a satellite that it's a very expensive satellite and I have limited capacity for taking images, I want to avoid the thing taking images where there's cloud cover because that would be a waste of its time. So a different satellite running 15 minutes ahead of it in the same orbit can look, detect the cloud cover, and tell the satellite behind it, hey, take the picture from a different angle so you avoid the clouds. All right? So there's all kinds of things that people have been talking about. So 
All right, so that's just to set up the problem. So let's talk about the questions. So I don't have answers to these questions, uh, but I want to pose them and get us thinking about them a little bit. Um, so how do we harness all of these data sources? I don't want to just say sensor networks, although sensor networks are an important data source, but how do we harness these real-time data sources on the Internet to do this broad scientific research? And this is what you know, one aspect of what people call e-science. Um, now, the domain scientists I claim are going to need a much richer interface than TCP IP and probably even the, the lower level, you know, SOAP type things that we're doing today. They're going to want to think about interchange between different data formats. Um, they're going to want to name data in terms of, you know, physically where is it located or how was it acquired or what logical properties does it have, when was it taken rather than uh, IP address or URL. Okay, um, they're going to need to have some way of tracking data, data provenance and, and, and annotations. Um, how do we take all the sensor data and push it to the Internet? You know, we've been playing around with SOAP. What about RDF or HTTP? Right now, a lot of it is raw byte streams or human readable stuff. I make graphs and put them on the Great Duck Island web page. It's not, not clear that, that that's programmatically accessible. Um, and then the other direction, so pushing the sensor data up, how do we retask the sensors and support multiple applications and concurrent queries to these, these things? And that's you know, a big chunk of what Joe just finished talking about in, in Virus Suite and other projects. But we need to think about how to support multiple applications and protect privacy and manage access to these resources. Um, another question is, given that I've got all these, at, these sensors all over the, the, the world, perhaps, how do I distribute the query processing itself onto the Internet? And I'm sure a lot of people in this room have been thinking about that, too. But unlikely that we want every user of the NEON system to suck all the data down to their, their machines locally to do the processing. Right now, the um, EarthScope project, in the, they have a GPS-based geodesy. They're uploading all this data to an FTP server in Colorado. And so if you want that data, you FTP to that site in Colorado and you pull down the data that you want. And then you do your processing on it. And so that's, that's fine for kind of studies where you're looking at data that's six months old. But if you wanted to do anything in real time, it's unlikely to work well. Um, how, how do we find these sensor sources? I mean, right now, I, I'd say most of us, I, I remember like three URLs, and one of them is Google. And so it's unlikely that we're going to, you know, remember the old FT, the canonical FTP site list? You know, this text file that went around said, here's all the FTP sites in the world and what they have, GIFs, 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 right? Well, what about sensors.google.com now serving 8 trillion, 197 billion, whatever sensor networks? I mean, how are we going to index this stuff? How are we going to find it? So my argument here is that I think that we in this room are the ones that need to be going and doing this because in some sense, the hard, I mean, the hard sciences are the one, they're building their own solutions anyway. And if we, and, and many of us in this room, I think we've been very good about working with the domain scientists. And that's good. Not everybody in the, in the field does that. But I think we tend to because we're very close to what they need. And I think that we should be going to the next step and talking about how do we partner with them to address all of these issues. Five minutes, and I'm almost done. Okay, so just to give you a little taste of stuff that we're, another project that we have at Harvard to look at this issue of querying many real-time data sources on the Internet. Um, we have a paper coming up in ICDE as well on this. The idea is a project called Hourglass, and here's the idea. Let's say that we have a bunch of data sources all over the, in this case, just the continental U.S., um, and we're going to make use of an overlay network, and in this case we're using Planet Lab as the way of getting started, but it could be almost anything. And then a bunch of users that want to issue different queries to this data. The question is, where do I, if you, if you think about your query as a bunch of, as a, as a, your classic database style of a tree of, of operators that are, you know, processing data and pushing them up, where do they run? And do I run it at one location or do I distribute it? And if I have many queries that are doing similar things, how do I co-locate their operations and so forth? Well, what we've been looking at is the, the networking side of this is trying to optimize the placement of these query operators on the Internet to reduce the total amount of network bandwidth that you're consuming. This is an efficiency metric that we're going for. We're gonna, we call this a stream-based overlay network. So the idea is if you know about DHTs, DHTs are one type of overlay network that are very good at storing tuples like a, a hash table. Well, stream-based overlay network is a uh, new design that's really focused on streaming data and optimizing the, the routing of that. So 
In this case, if we have a user here querying data, we're going to be placing filters and aggregators and other types of query operators on these hosts based on the network performance between these different sites. And so we monitor that stuff in real time and we tune the placement and we migrate things as necessary. Now, I don't have time to go into how it works, but that's the idea. There's another, uh, this uh, is some thinking that we had. Uh, There's a, a workshop at Berkeley on sensor network architectures. And there, the sensor network architecture, a lot of the, the discussion was about sort of low level MAC access for broadcast, in, you know, unreliable broadcast um, down inside of a sensor network. And I started to ask the question, well, what about IP? I mean, at what point do our sensor networks run IP? We've got many specialized solutions today, and so I've been thinking about IP is probably ultimately what we're going to end up with anyway, whether we like it or not. And we need to start thinking about what does that mean to give every sensor node in the world one or more IP addresses? You know, um, so you know, there's a reason. There's a lot of good reasons to go to IP. Um, although I'm going to claim it's probably not for all sensor networks. So in Deborah's terminology and tenant, you might imagine, you know, the microservices have IP addresses, but the little moat clouds don't. But down the, no. but they do. No, no, no. That's not you might imagine. I just meant that. That that is that is the case. I see. Um, so. Well, of course, yeah. No, the IP is the lowest level stuff. So, but you gotta you gotta bootstrap yourself somehow. So, you know, lots of issues. People have said, you know, well, you can't run IP on moats. And I did a demo that these guys at HP put together. So basically, run TCP a small TCP/IP stack on a Telos moat and a web server on the moat, and it has an IP address. And I point my web browser to it, and you can see the temperature. So it works. You can do it. It uses up all the memory on the moat. But the point is, this is this is it's feasible to do that. Um, People are worried about the byte limits and the packet headers. I don't know how much that's a problem. Um, what about the, the, but I think the, the deeper question really is the architecture. IP is about addressing hosts and, and indirectly services through port numbers. And I, I don't know how to think about a sensor network. Does a whole sensor network have one IP address or a million IP addresses? And do I use multicast? What's the right, how does that all tie together? Yes. Right. Maybe IP is appropriate. Right. I mean, the problem is more the disruptive communication. It's not, it's not IP that's the problem. It's TCP. You don't necessarily want to do an end-to-end -end TCP connection on the back. You just you can pop the data there. Well, IP. Yeah. we'll talk about the top one. But yeah, it's, I think the argument for is that end-to-end -end is sort of a one-hop. You have network aggregation, which IP doesn't do. Right? I don't want to distract this kind of because we know we're tight on time here, but Right. What's the question of what you mean by aggregation and what you're aggregating across? And so, so I think this is the. I, I don't have the answer, and, and none of us do. Hopefully, we can start to think about this because I think this is very important. Some of it has to do with where do we think sensor platforms are headed? Do we think that our sensor nodes in the future are going to be dust or inhalable? I saw the Slashdot comments when the Smart Dust article went online and. People wrote you know, the things like, well, what happens when you inhale your smart dust? Um, or are they going to have more? I mean, these, these you know, for volca vol volcano monitoring and many environmental things, the sensor nodes are going to be more like bricks. Anyway, so it's, it's unclear that we can't put Linux on there. So, um, so just to take away, basically, I think that this is, this is the really rich problem, the really interesting open problem for us as a community. We, we're, we're at the point now where our sensor networks are giving us more data than we know what to do with. We want to implement really interesting applications, especially those that span multiple geographically dispersed sensor networks all over the planet, potentially. I think in order to go to that next level, we need to think about how do we tie the networks into the internet and what's the right architecture for doing that, because otherwise we're just going to end up with a bunch of stovepipe systems that don't talk to each other, and we all know what that leads to. So I guess that's all I have. Thank you.
I see I've soundly defeated any possible. Devers doesn't even have anything to say now. It's amazing. I thought we were cleaning up after the discussion. There's, there's, um, I think I have two different uh, takes on this. One is there's a lot that's been going on, whether it's the right approach or not, of the grid community. Yes, a lot of right. The problems, they're not different. What's, a lot of things that you involved that they. Yes, yes, of course. That's right. So this was this was brought up. This point about the grid, and the question is, isn't the grid doing this already? And my claim is that um, the grid community has been to date focused on a very a similar but different set of problems. Right. That's right. Well, data grids, and so well, one of the one of the, the cynical comment is, by working on this problem, we are working on grid. So therefore, I'm a grid person. So speaking for the grid community, as a grid person, I'd say the grid community hasn't really been working on that problem. Anyway. <laughs> it's a self-defeat. <laughs>